Last week, we began this series by taking a look at the history of sort of where Joseph came from. And what we saw was that he came from a family of chaos, a family that would make a good reality television show material today, or even better, soap opera. And this, this family was just riddled with chaos and upheaval and hatred and uh, scheming and all sorts of other things. And, and even in that, though, we saw small hints that God had something special for this boy named Joseph. And we sort of ended last week with Genesis 37, verse 2, and we see a 17-year-old Joseph tending sheep with his brothers. And as I mentioned last week, there are three aims in this series. Three aims. The first one is to understand and see that the story of Joseph is not really a story about Joseph. It's a story about God. The main point of the story of Joseph is to point us to God and his sovereignty. So that's number one. Number two is we need to rightly learn to see, or we need to learn to rightly see ourselves in the text. We oftentimes read ourselves into the text in a very wrong, uh, narcissistic way. And we need to learn to rightly see ourselves in the text. And the third aim is that we would see how the Old Testament stories, and in particular this one, point us to Christ. We would learn to see Christ in the Old Testament. In other words, the Old Testament, the stories of the Old Testament, are not just these unrelated stories that have no connection and are about a person. The stories of the Old Testament are part of this beautiful mosaic of God's revelation of himself and pointing to Jesus Christ. So with those aims in mind, we are going to be in chapter 37. You know, for time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole chapter as we begin. You could do that on your own later this week or as we're working through the text. But the, the main point I want us to see this morning is that those favored by God and used by God will face opposition and suffering. Those who are favored by God and used by God will face opposition and suffering. However, God sovereignly oversees it and orchestrates it to bring about great things. In the midst of the mess, God is still working to create beauty. And so, as we look at the story of Jacob or Joseph uh, in chapter 37, we're sort of going to work, uh, work through it in the three major movements of the chapter. There's really three big parts of this chapter. The first one is this gift of a coat that his father gives to him, which if you're not familiar with Joseph or you haven't read this story, you probably know about this coat. Um, so we'll look at the, the coat, and then we're going to look at his interaction with his brothers, and then finally we're going to look at, um, at God's sovereign care for Joseph. And so maybe, the, maybe a better title for the first section would be his, his father, his relationship with his father. Um, so let's start there. In chapter 37, we see that Joseph is the object of his father's special affection. Look at verse 3. Now Israel, now that's the name of Jacob, his name got changed, so the writer is calling him Israel now. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons. So there it is. The object of his father's special affection. And why did he feel this way about Joseph in particular? If we keep reading, it says, because he was the son of his old age. So I, I have seen this in different family situations at times. So there's uh, perhaps a, a, a gap between the youngest child and the next child of a, a few significant years, maybe as a surprise baby that uh, no one was really expecting. And uh, the, the child is born when the parents are a little bit older. And 
this is anecdotal. This is totally anecdotal, right? But, but I've seen how that youngest child with like a 10, 15 year gap between them and the next one is kind of treated differently than the others were. Maybe it's because of age. Maybe it's because the, the parents are a little bit older and less enthusiastic about chasing their kids all over the house. Or, or maybe it's because they thought they were done with children and, and then this new baby shows up and there's just a special place in their heart for this baby. But, but it's not hard. My point is it's not hard for us to see how this could happen, right? There's a significant age gap between Joseph and his other brothers. And here's this young Joseph who was born to the object of his father's deepest longing, Rachel. The, the woman that he worked 14 years for. The woman that he thought he had and then was tricked into getting her older sister instead. The, the, the one true love of Jacob's life. And the only two sons were born to this woman and Jacob. She died bearing the second one, but Joseph, after ten other boys and one other girl, was finally born to Rachel. And, he, and Jacob was a little bit older when this happened. And so there's a sort of a unique relationship between Jacob and Joseph. And this is expressed in the gift of a coat. And we see that in verse 3 as well. And, when, uh, and he, that is Israel or Jacob, made him a robe of many co- colors. This is an expression of his love and affection for his son. He, he made this coat, and, and like, I don't know what it looked like. I don't know if it was like rainbowed going like this. Or maybe it was like a mosaic thing, like a postmodern art type of interpretive thing. I don't know. It, the point is there were a lot of colors. It was ornate. It was beautiful, and it was made by hand by his father. This was a gift of love from Jacob to Joseph. And in this, look at verse 4. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him. So Jacob gives this coat to Joseph as an expression of his affection, which is uniquely set upon Joseph over and above all of his other brothers, and the brothers don't like it. Isn't it interesting that a coat can make somebody mad to the point where they hate somebody? Have you ever thought about that? Like, we, we think about Joseph and the coat and the brothers, and they, like, The reaction was to a coat. He gave a gift of a coat to one of, you know, to their brother. And and it's like, the heck? Seems a bit over the top, right? Two, Two things on that. Number one, the coat is an expression of the affection. So the coat represented something, which we're going to come to in a second. But before we're too quick to get after the brothers, there are people that leave churches over coats. There are people that break relationships over coats. There are people where the slightest, smallest, little thing can cause a gigantic rift in fellowship. This coat set Joseph apart. It set him above his brothers. And if a coat can make somebody mad, then the issue is much deeper than the coat itself. Right? There's a sense in which this coat was an expression not only of Jacob's love and care for Joseph, but also an expression of Joseph's, or of Joseph's role in leadership in the family. So if you remember the oldest child, Reuben, last time, uh, he slept with his father's concubine. And all we're told is that Jacob heard of it. Jacob knew. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to pass the leadership of this family on to my oldest son who betrayed me like this. 
And it seems as though Joseph has these leadership qualities or leadership gifts. And so Jacob decides that Joseph is going to be the one that is put in charge. There's a sense in which this coat represents Joseph's leadership in the family. And so Joseph then was excused from doing some of the menial tasks. He was more of a managerial role. We'll see that in a few minutes because Jacob tells Joseph, hey, go find your brothers. They're out in the field tending sheep. Joseph apparently was not with them and was in charge of them in some sense. So Jacob goes to Joseph, Rachel's son, as the one who will lead. And so he is not now doing menial tasks. tasks. And for the brothers, the coat's always there, right? He probably wore it a lot. He probably liked it. And so he wears this coat, and there, there goes Joseph with his stupid coat, sitting there bickering among themselves. Look at Joseph in his stupid multicolored coat that dad made for him and gave him. Who does he think he is? He just puts that coat on and flaunts it in front of us, walks around. That coat is always there. I hate that coat. I hate what it represents. I hate the person wearing it. I hate Joseph. We are often can fall into that same trap. If we're to rightly see ourselves in the text, we need to see how easy it is for us to identify with these brothers. We need to see how easy it is for us to show uh, favoritism in our families. It probably wasn't wise for Jacob to give Joseph this coat. I mean, he himself was the object of favoritism of his mother. So think about this. Jacob, the second born, was was encouraged by his mother to steal the birthright of Esau, his older brother, because his mother liked him more. So what happened as a result of that? The relationship between Jacob and Esau was fractured so much so that when they're coming back into town after being away and getting two wives and two concubines and 12 children, they're coming back into town and Esau shows up or is coming after them with 400 men. Jacob should have known what it's like to be the object of favoritism. He should have seen what it's like for that to fracture relationships in families. So if we're to rightly see ourselves in the text, we should rightly see ourselves as those that at times show favoritism even within our own families. Beware of favoritism. I've talked with many adults I'm not exaggerating. Like, I'm not saying many in the sense that I've talked to a lot of people and there's really nobody, right? I'm I'm, I'm being very serious. I've talked to many adults who still deal with wounds in their hearts because whether reality or by perception, their parents favored another child over them and they saw it. Our children are not stupid. And those wounds run deep and whether or not they're legitimate, in the sense that they objectively happen, if there is a perception of favoritism, that can damage our children. We've heard, well, got to deal with mom. Let's have Susan do it. She's the favorite. How do we combat that? How do we cherish each child as unique? I would submit that the way that we do that is by seeing the way that God loves his children. God does not show favoritism toward his children. He loves each of his unique children in the exact same way that he loves his only unique son. In other words, the love that the Father has for all of His children who are adopted through union with Christ, the love that He has for all of us who are in Christ is the same love that He has for Christ, His only begotten Son Himself. 
There is no favoritism in the family of God. There are no second-class citizens in the family of God. There are no, well, you know, Jesus is the favorite, and we're just sort of tagging along with Jesus. Because the love that the Father has for us is a love that is found in Jesus Christ and comes to us through Jesus Christ such that we are co-heirs with Christ. Do you realize that? God does not say, well, Jesus is my favorite. He gets everything. And, uh, John, you're just kind of like, eh. Kind of made it in by the skin of your teeth. And kind of a a rebellious moron at times. So uh, I'm just going to let you tag along with with Jesus and, and pick up after him. There are no second-class citizens in the family of God. There are no favorites within the family of God. Favoritism within our families in particular is foolishness. And it leads to chaos and anger and fury and destruction. So as parents, we should love our children the same way that God loves us. We should treasure the uniqueness of each child in the same way that God treasures the uniqueness of each of his children. God created each of us different and distinct. He created each of us with different strengths and different weaknesses. And he loves each of us with those realities. Your children have different strengths and different weaknesses. Your children have different personalities. Do you love each of them uniquely as your own unique children in the same way that you love your other unique child? So Joseph was, first of all, the object of his father's special affection, and this caused some problems in the family. So secondly, we see the brothers. Look at verses Uh, Look at verse 4. Just look at verse 4, which we were just in. It says, But when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all of his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. There's sort of a progression that happens here. If you look at uh, verse 4 and then 5 and then 8 and 11, see in verse 4, they hated him and couldn't speak peacefully to him. In verse 5, now Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. And then verse 8, we see that, or are they in, or uh, so when he says, uh, verse 8, his brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more. So they hated him more, now they hated him more than more. And then in verse 11, and his brothers were jealous of him. And if you read down to uh, verse 20, they see him coming from afar, and they say, well, there comes the dreamer. Let's kill him. It did not start with, let's kill Joseph. It started with, man, I hate him. I hate how dad loves him. I hate how dad gives him special treatment and special gifts. I hate how this little younger brother seems to be in a position where he's exempt from the menial work. And and then Joseph, we'll come to this in, in a second, but Joseph brings some information to them from some dreams that he had. And they're like, I hate him even more, that little bugger. Oh, I remember when he was little. We should have just kicked him then. Ah, Joseph thinks he's going to rule over us. Who does he think he is? He's younger than us. That doesn't work like that. And it culminates with, let's kill him. What could cause these brothers to hate their brothers so much? I think there's a couple things that we see. First of all, in verse 2, look at what it says in verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 year old, was. Uh, by the way, uh, side note: when you're reading Genesis and you read the words "these are the generations of," that is a verbal 
cue to tell you we're moving on to a new part of a story or a new movement in God's bigger story of Genesis. It's like a verbal, hey, new, new movement, new scene. Okay, so these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zelph, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. So now Joseph's a tattletale, right? Now, if you've got younger siblings, what is the worst part of having younger siblings when you're a kid? It's the kid's a little rat. No one likes a rat. This little kid, man, I can't do anything without them going to mom and dad and saying, Mom, you don't know what so-and-so did. I, I love my sisters. They ratted me out a lot. So maybe there's some, like, maybe there's some, some internal strife that I'm dealing with right now in front of you all. But it seemed like I couldn't do anything without them ratting me out to mom and dad. And I didn't even know about it sometimes, right? It just mom comes up to you, hey, do you take something out of the uh, cookie jar the other day? And I'm like, no, of course not, Mom. Huh, it's funny because your sister said you did. Ah, Dang it. Bad report, right? I think the difference here is that Joseph seems to be in, in some form of leadership role. He's kind of like, it seems like he's charged with the care of the flocks as an overseer in a sense. And so he's bringing this bad report. Now, given what we know about these brothers, it's kind of amazing to me that he only brings one bad report. There's a lot of bad reports that we can find about these brothers, right? Um, and, and he only brings one. So maybe this guy's just being a little bit, or maybe Joseph's just being a little bit gracious to his brothers. But, it, it, but he's not seeing what this is doing, right? He brings this bad report, and he brings this bad report, and then the, the brothers get all upset with him. And then, so there's that. Then there's the issue of the coat, which we talked about. Um, it sort of seems like an overreaction. They couldn't even say a kind word to him. In verse 11, they're jealous. That's sort of the root of it. That's, that's the sort of base issue here. They're jealous of their brother. Now listen, jealousy is a massive problem in all of our relationships. If we're just really honest, jealousy is a constant battle that we fight. We tend to be jealous creatures. We tend to look at other people and we tend to see their successes and their joys as bad things. And we get angry with them because we're jealous of them. And this is the thing like jealousy will eat you alive. You realize, like, if you're jealous of me, it doesn't matter to me. Have you ever thought about that? Like, a lot of times our jealousy happens in the hidden parts of our heart and is never really expressed. In other words, somebody could be jealous of me. I don't know it. I don't care. Who does it hurt? It hurts you. When I'm jealous of somebody else, it hurts me. It just sort of eats at us and, and oh, sort of tears up our insides. And, and you see this with Joseph's brothers. They're jealous, and they just progressively begin to hate him more and more and more and more, so much so that they are willing to kill him. And, and don't be too quick to judge the brothers. Again, we need to rightly see ourselves in the text. Listen, there are people that I have met, and I will include myself in this because we struggled with this, right? Okay, so the, just personal story. Carly and I had trouble having children, and we, we weren't able to have kids for a while. And, and all of our friends around us were having kids. Now, what do we know about children? We know that children are a blessing from the Lord. We know that children are heritage from the Lord. We know that there's like the little arrow quiver thing going on. Like it's, it's really a blessed thing to have a full quiver of arrows. Unless it's not me that has the full quiver of arrows. It just kind of sucks. All of your friends are posting pictures on Instagram and Facebook of, oh, we're pregnant, and oh, we're going to name him this, and oh, we're having a boy, oh, we're having a girl. Dang it. Ah, why do they have to put that stuff on there? I hate them. 
I wish they weren't having kids. Why? Because I can't have kids. Right? Jealousy. Do you see the folly in that? Like God is blessing somebody else and all we can think about is ourselves. What are the brothers thinking about? They're thinking about themselves, my position, my status. This little boy that I helped change his diapers, he's not going to rule over me. Totally self-centered, totally selfish. Here's an interesting thing. If you think about jealousy, you will find that when you are jealous, you are always focusing on yourself and yourself alone. You are not focusing on God blessing others, and you are not focusing on God as a sovereign dispenser of blessing. And we had to come to grips with I had to come to grips with that. I had to learn to be happy for friends who were having children. Isn't that a weird thing to have to learn? It just shows how easy it is to fall into this trap, and, and I see it in lots of different ways. I see it in my own life. I see it in the lives of other people. I see young couples that want to have kids but can't and then get upset when others do, just like we experience. I see people that have friends that get promotions, and they're angry with them and jealous of them because they think that they deserve that promotion more. I see people who experience success in a material sense, and God blesses them in that area, And there are other people that come right alongside that are jealous of that. I see people that are jealous of other people's marriages because, oh, I wish we had that. I see people that are jealous of other people's spiritual maturity. Oh, I wish I had that. I see people that are jealous of other people's age. I mean, jealousy is a massive issue. And all of it comes back to the fact that we are focusing on ourselves. We're, we're totally self-centered. We're not seeing God as a sovereign dispenser of joy and blessing and benefit. And we're not seeing others as the recipients of those benefits and therefore uh, that situation being reason to praise God. There's a story that I heard of a Greek athlete and uh, there was a rival athlete who was better than him And so they erected a statue in the center of the city to honor this athlete. And uh, the the inferior athlete was very angry and jealous of this. And so he came up with a plan. He was going to go every night with a chisel and a hammer and start to chisel away at the foundation or the base of this statue in order to bring it down. And eventually his plan was, little by little, he would chip away at it, and eventually the statue would fall and everything would be set right. Well, his plan worked. The only problem is when it fell over, he happened to be under it and it crushed him. Is that not how jealousy works in our lives? We try to chip away and chip away and chip away, and it ends up just crushing us. They couldn't be happy for their brother because they were focused on themselves. And what they didn't recognize and what we need to recognize is that God sovereignly does and works things in people's lives, and that is how you fight jealousy. So think of John the Baptist. John the Baptist is baptizing and Jesus comes along and there's all these people that are going to Jesus and all the people come up to John and they're like, hey man, your ministry is in jeopardy. You were the guy that was known for baptizing. That's your gig, right? You're John the Baptist for crying out loud. Now there's this other person that's baptizing more people than you. You're going to lose everything that you've worked for. You are the Baptist. You're the baptizer. Like, go do something about this. They, They can't take your gig. Tell them to go find another river. Jeez, there's probably plenty of them. Go baptize in another region. Leave this area to to John. And what does John respond with? He must increase. I must decrease. As we see God sovereignly giving good gifts and good things and joy and peace to other people. Are we elevating God by thanking Him for that and rejoicing in His good blessing being bestowed upon others and thereby decreasing ourselves? Or do we elevate ourselves and think, I deserve that. I'm entitled to that. I want that. And decrease the emphasis on the grace of God and the goodness of God and His sovereign wisdom that He gives gifts. Listen, God does everything for the good of His children. 
Everything. Not one thing happens in this world that is not for the good of his children. Meaning that if you didn't get something, guess what? It's for your good. God does not withhold any good thing from his children. Which means that in that season where we were not having children and we were jealous, or I was, I won't speak for Carly because I don't think that she was jealous because she's just a little bit, a lot more sanctified than me. But she, like in this season when I was jealous of these other people having children, was God really withholding anything good from me? No. Why? He was teaching me. He was training me. He was teaching me that Christ is enough. He was teaching me that I can find all of my joy, all of my contentment in God. He was teaching me that God has already given me amazing good gifts in the wife that he provided for me and the church family he gave me and other people's children that surrounded me that I was able and blessed to be able to influence and be around. He was teaching me to be content with what he had given me. And when he finally did give us children, my joy in those children, in those good gifts are exponentially higher now than they ever would have been before. So don't tell me that that was a bad thing. That was God sovereignly doing good for us and for others around us and teaching us. And if if that's not enough, 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, what do you have that has not been given to you? You have everything. If we have Christ, we have enough. All right, moving on. I'm sorry, sidetrack. A little bit of a soapbox. Let's move on. Then you see uh, not only the issue of the, uh, the coat and the bad report that made the brothers hate him, but you also see these dreams in verses 5 through 11. Now Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field. And behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Great, J- Joseph. Thanks for that. You dreamed this first dream. Now you're going to tell us about this other one. What do you got for us now, Joseph? On this one, Behold, the sun and the moon and the and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Oh, pfft. Here we go, dreamer boy. Another one where we're all bowing down to. It doesn't take a genius to figure out what this one's about. We're 11 brothers, and then there's Jacob. What, are you the son? But when, his brother, when, but when he told it to his father, which his father's included in this one now, when he told it to his father and his brothers, indeed, um, sorry, lost my place. When he told it to his father and his brothers, His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers come, indeed come, and bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him. So these dreams are contributing to this too. So just sort of walk through this with me. Joseph comes and and tells him a dream and says, You're going to bow the knee to me. And then he comes with another one. And the response is, Joseph, we hate you. We hate you. You think we're going to bow to you? You think we're going to submit to you? You little squirt. No. Get out of here. It's beginning to be kind of easy to see how the brothers would want to kill him. People often hate being under authority. People often hate being under authority because we hate being under God's authority apart from God working in our hearts and changing our hearts and giving us eyes to see the truth. But even as redeemed people, we don't like being under authority, especially because God often uses the most unlikely of people to lead. Have you noticed that? God uses the most unlikely of people to lead. We see just sort of all throughout the Bible, Moses is stuttering. 
You got Paul, who was a Pharisee. You got Peter, who was a dumb Galilean fisherman. You got Matthew, who was a tax collector. You got James, the brother of Jesus, who actually didn't believe in his own brother for a long time. You got Joseph, who came out of this train wreck of a family. You got Abraham, who was a who was an idol worshiper. God has this way of using unlikely people to lead. And then, he's, then his brothers are like, are you kidding me? I'm not going to bow down to you. I don't see this. So at this point in the story, no one likes him. 17 years old, and no one likes him. Now, you remember what it was like to be 17? How much was approval important to you at 17? It was everything. Here's a 17-year-old boy. Nobody likes him. His brothers don't like him. His father's cooling on him. And here's my point. Joseph shouldn't have turned out the way he did. Right? In our co- contemporary cultural context, if, if a kid comes out of this type of situation, one would expect him to like, turn emo and wear all black and get some sort of like black nail polish on his fingers and listen to weird music in his headphones all day long while sitting in his room. And, and it's like this, yeah, that would make sense. This doesn't make sense. Joseph doesn't make sense. Joseph should have turned out very differently. So why didn't he turn out like that? Point number three. We've seen the father's affection. We've seen the brother's jealousy and hatred. And then we see God's providential care. By that, I mean God, as an act of grace, preserves and governs events in the lives of his creature. So in verse 12. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, "Are you not, or are you, are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them." Maybe not the best idea, right? Let's think back. J- Joseph's not exactly popular with his brothers. Jacob's experienced what it's like to have enmity between him and his brother. His brothers tried to kill him. What did Joseph say? Is he like, Dad, they, they hate me. They don't want to listen to me. They don't want to be around me. He just says, okay, I'll go. And so he went in obedience to seek out those who hated him. And as he walked away, that would be the last time that his father would see his son for 20 years. Jacob sent him out to get his brothers, and he would not see his cherished, beloved son again for 20 years. And God was providentially in control of these situations. God was working now for the future. We're going to come to it. Like, this is a hard story to just sort of work through because you want to get to the end. Because at the end, there's a famine, and the very person that has been placed in a position to be able to save God's people is the person that they hated. Even now, in these situations and in these circumstances that, see, that seem so beyond understanding and seem so desperate, God is working for future good. It was better for Joseph to go and all of the events in his life to happen, then for him to stay safe, stay, stay safe, living a life of ease. Okay, listen to this. It was better for Joseph to go and experience all of the pain and all of the sorrow and all of the rejection and all of the hatred and all of the mistreatment and all of the imprisonment than it was for him to stay safe, living a life of ease. So don't try to determine God's guidance on the basis of ease and comfort. He travels about 65 miles. In verse 18, we see, and they saw him from afar. So just, I mean, this is a this is a five mile an hour culture, right? So he's a camel, horse, whatever, walking. It takes a while from the time he crests the ridge to the time he gets to his brothers, and in that time, they are plotting to kill him. 
They said to one another, here comes the dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. And then we will say a fierce animal has devoured him and we will see that, and we will see what has become of his dreams. You catch that like mocking, God-hating tone. Let's take care of this little dreamer boy. If we kill him, I bet you we'll see if those dreams come true. What kept them from killing Joseph? Is God working? Is God working through one of his brothers who said, no, 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 we can't kill him. Let's just throw him in a pit. Is God working through Judah who said, guys, we can't put his blood on our hands. Here's a caravan of Ishmaelites. Let's just sell him to them. And it was in the midst of that difficult situation and the difficult situations to follow that God was working to bring about great good. God was sovereignly working to bring Joseph to a place where he would be used by God to save his brothers who hate him so much. So they lie to their father then to cover up their deceit. Jealousy always results in corruption and lying. Jealousy doesn't care for others. They didn't care about what it did to their father. They know how much their father loved Joseph. They didn't care about his heart. They didn't care about what this would do to their dad. Look, I'm afraid that many of us are too addicted to ease and comfort, and we think that anytime something rough or something bad happens to us, God has abandoned us. Because we have taught ourselves and we have ingested a steady diet that God's blessing means ease and comfort and prosperity. That is what the devil promises. That is not what Christ promises. Christ promises there will be suffering, there will be hardship, there will be difficulty, but I will be with you the entire time. If you gauge God's blessing by your ease and by your comfort, you are not gauging it rightly. And if you think that God has abandoned you, whenever you walk through some trial or difficulty, you do not understand understand God's sovereignty or his providence or his character. And you are not trusting in his promise that he will never leave us or forsake us. Never. In the good, in the bad. In the victory, in the defeat. In the joy, in the sorrow. God will never leave his children or forsake them. Do not be surprised, my brothers, when the fiery trial comes upon you as though some strange thing has happened to you. So, we see in chapter 37 that it ends with Joseph being sold to a caravan, and then the Midianites sold him to Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and God is working. God is orchestrating. God is working over a slow process of 20 years to bring him to a point where he needed to be to save his people and keep his promises. So, as we close with this, those three aims, those original three aims. Number one, the story is about God and his sovereignty, not primarily about Joseph. God is in control of the pit and the hatred, and the situation, just like he is in control of the fulfillment of the dreams in raising Joseph to be used. I have to believe that these same brothers that said, let's kill him, throw him in a pit, and see what happens of these dreams, were reminded of that as Joseph revealed himself to them. And they were bowing before him in fulfillment of God's purpose. They had to think about that. We're sorry, Joseph, we're sorry. You meant it for evil. God meant it for good. God turns evil, hard situations around for good. God works everything together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And only a sovereign God is able to do that. God is on the throne. And he is intimately interested in the affairs 
of our lives. And not only that, but He is sovereignly working in the affairs of our lives. And so do not be surprised if you suffer. Do not be surprised if you have hardship. And do not allow that to lead you to question whether God is really there. Number two, how should we see ourselves? And two things on this. We need to learn with Joseph not to be mad when God prospers us. Some of us have like a guilt complex when God blesses us in a certain way. Sort of like what, what I was talking about with the, the kid thing, right? It'd be very easy to say, oh, well, we shouldn't post this or we shouldn't tell anybody about this, you know. Eh, I don't want to mess with other people or there are going to be people that are jealous. And, you know, like, no, rejoice in God's blessings. You should rejoice in God's blessings. When he blesses you, rejoice in it. Be thankful for it. Praise him for it. And if others don't join you in that, that's not your fault. That's their fault. That's their problem. God's blessing is occasion for praise and joy. Always. God's blessing is not occasion for hiding it under a bushel so that nobody else sees it. Now, there's a, there's a fine line, I get that. We don't want to flaunt our stuff, or we don't want to flaunt this, or flaunt our success, or flaunt this. But if we do it in a God-glorifying, God-honoring, thankful, heart-driven way, we should rejoice in the blessings that God gives us. If we have a happy marriage, we should rejoice in the blessing of a happy marriage. If we have children, we should rejoice in our children. If we have gotten promoted, we should rejoice in that promotion. If we have been blessed with close friends, we should rejoice in that. Whatever the situation where God is blessing you, when, when, when salvation happens, we don't hide that. Because there are others that aren't saved that might feel bad that they're not saved. We rejoice in it. We praise God for it. We put his glory on display for it. So we need to learn with Joseph not to be mad when God prospers us, not to hide that. But we also need to learn with the brothers not to be jealous when God prospers somebody else. God did it. God only gives good gifts to his children. God does not withhold any good thing for us, we should, from us. We should rejoice in God's blessings of others and rejoice not only in his blessing of others, but in recognition of the blessings that he has given us. Look, Joseph didn't ask for the coat. He didn't ask to be put in charge. He didn't manufacture the dreams himself. And if we don't have something, we need to recognize that it's because it's what's best for us. And trust in God in the midst of that. The way you overcome jealousy is joy. The way you overcome hatred is worship. The way you overcome envy is thanksgiving. We've seen stories about God and his sovereignty. What should we see? How should we see ourselves in this text? And finally, Christ. Do you see Jesus in this story? As we're walking through this, do you see Jesus? You can go, to, go with me to the other side of the Bible in Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 18. Now Christ here is being presented to Pilate. And he says, who should we give up? Should we give Barabbas or give Jesus? Verse 18. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. The Pharisees and religious leaders did not like this man that was chosen to reveal God. He had no education. He was a carpenter. He was unlearned. They hated him. They were envious of him. They were jealous of him. We're not going to bow down to somebody like this. We're not, going to bend, we're not going to bend the knee to somebody like this. You think you're going to reign over us, Jesus? Here's the deal. A lot of us can identify with this too. We're, we're kind of okay with having Jesus in the back seat. We're not okay with him driving. We're okay with having him be Savior but not Lord. We agree that he's sovereign, just don't be too sovereign over us. And 
And, and just like Joseph held in his hands the answers to the brother's deepest needs, so Christ also holds in his hands the answers to our deepest needs. Just as Joseph went traveling to find those who hated him and would reject him, so Jesus went to find those who hate him and reject him. Isaiah 53, 3, he's a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. Isaiah 53, 3 could very well be talking about Joseph if we don't see Christ. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And as from one who men would hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. When he's, Joseph is reunited with his brothers, they don't recognize him. He speaks through an interpreter and he has to go to his room and cry and then compose himself. And they bow. And there's one day when every knee will bow before Jesus. And as we've worked through this, we've seen that Joseph was favored by his father. He was hated and envied by his brothers. And he was the object of God's special providential care in the same way that Jesus was uniquely favored by his father. In the same way that Jesus was envied and hated by man. In the same way he suffered at the hands of those that he loved. And in it all, God was sovereign. So let me close with this from Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The cross was not a reaction. It was a plan. What happened to Christ was not open-ended. It was sovereignly orchestrated by God in the same way that God sovereignly orchestrated this Savior to be rejected, hated, sold for money, abandoned, and eventually would be the only way that his people would live. Let's pray. Father, I ask now that as we think about this story, that we would not let it just linger at Joseph, but that it would propel us forward to see Christ, to rejoice in Christ, to see your providential care for your people and providing for us a Savior. To see that those that once despised and rejected Christ are forgiven by Him through faith. And to see that Christ, the object of your special affection, makes us as your people the object of your special affection. Father, help us to rejoice in that and glory in that. In Jesus' name, amen.